I just want to say, first of all, JJ, thank you for leading this church the way you do, man. What a blessing. Thank you for that strong challenge about life. And uh, we're going to be praying for Florida and, and that special uh, election, special vote on, on the 4th. Uh, what a thrill. What an honor to get to be here. I do want to thank STF. You guys have been an incredible blessing uh, in, in Teesside, which is in the northeast of England. Uh, I've been coming several years. Chris started coming a long, long time ago uh, when he was on staff at another church in Tampa. Um, and then uh, as soon as he got here, he was like, man, we want to come. And I'm like, please do. We need you. And so what a blessing uh, to have you guys involved on the ground um, in the United Kingdom. I'll tell you a little bit about our story in a moment. But I just wanted to say thanks, JJ and Sharon, for all you do. And uh, Michael and Ashley, thanks for bringing the team. And we, I see some of the guys from last summer. Um, it's just a real thrill to be here. Um, and so thanks for your investment um, in, our, in our churches over there, the community on the ground. Uh, England is, uh, so m- most folks, you may or may not know this, but um, uh, Europe is now the least reached continent in the world, 2.9%. Not, it's not an unreached people group. There's places all over the world that have never heard the name Jesus, like Papua New Guinea. There's places, there's tribes all over the world. In Colombia, my daughter flew into Colombia to reach uh, or, or do some, some journalistic work for an organization to help them reach an unreached people group, a place that's never had the gospel. Um, but right now, um, Europe has been declared the least reached continent in the world. Asia is 3.1%. Europe is 2.9%. Now, that's really hard for us to wrap our minds around because we get our spiritual heritage primarily in the U.S. from the continent of Europe. But it's become this really, really, really challenging place. I'll share a little of our story uh, as we get through this this morning. But I just want you to be aware of kind of where we're coming from on the European continent side of stuff. Uh, I was a youth pastor in America. I didn't grow up in church. Got saved on Young Life. I saw Young Life is in the missions thing over there. So got saved on a Young Life backpacking trip. Uh, in 1978, I was 16. Do the math. I'm old. That's why I was trying to tell Chris not to go too deep on my kids' ages, 36 to 26, okay? We have two grandkids coming in December. We have one already. So we're like, we're a growing family. We're pretty excited about it. But anyway, uh, so I, I didn't grow up in church, got saved on a Young Life backpacking trip, didn't know what it meant to be a follower of Jesus. I had this encounter with Christ. This, this youth pastor showed up at football practice, started discipling me. And I always tell people, if he'd have been a Methodist, I'd be a Methodist. But having to be a Baptist, and uh, he kind of walked me through what it meant to be a follower of Christ. And so I got tapped into the Baptist church, first church, real church experience. And then I surrendered to ministry right in my freshman year in college uh, at the University of Arkansas. I know we, we stink at most sports. But anyway, it's... it's uh, Except for baseball, um, track, you know, anyway, anyway, I don't know where I'm going there. But anyway, so the reality is uh, I spent 30 years in America in the North American church as a youth pastor. That's where JJ and I bumped into each other years and years and years ago. Um, And then um, I encountered England for the first time in 2005, and I'll share that in a moment. This morning, I want you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 9. Now listen, the crowds are growing around Jesus, and what I'm going to tell you or share with you from Scripture today is what I would consider to be a hard teaching, right? The title of the message on September 1st, 2024, as we turn the page from summer to fall, is come and die. So you're welcome, all right? That's, that's where we're headed this morning. God's calling on your life, God's calling on my life is to come and die. So I want to read this passage, then I'm going to pray, and then we're going to jump into this. Luke chapter 9, verse 23, and he said to all, because the crowds are growing around Jesus, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself Take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself or his soul? Some passages say. Let me pray for us. Holy Spirit, we invite you 
to move across our hearts? Would you capture our imagination and our minds and our hearts today? And God, would you give us a kingdom dream today? Would you give us kingdom vision today? That we would lose sight of the things of this world and be captivated by this teaching about laying our life down day after day to take up our cross and follow you and enter the realm of the gospel day in and day out as we lay down our lives for your kingdom's sake. And so, Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on this place. We thank you for your word, that it's living and active and sharp. It goes down deep into the hearts of those that hear it and that you do deep things in us. And we pray that you would do that in our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the first thing I want you to see as we kind of walk through this, these three or four verses, and, we're gonna, and I'm a youth pastor, so we're going to bounce around a little bit, okay? We're going to pick up a few other texts to pull in here because we really want us to capture this idea in our heart today. The first thing I want you to grab a hold of, though, is this, that Jesus, his posture is always invitation. He always invites. And so the first thing I want you to see is if anyone, we are all invited to know him and follow him. And that's, that's for the nations, that's for your neighbors, and that's for you and me. His invitation today is that we would know him and follow him. So we're all invited to know him and join him on mission. And then we're celebrating. Listen, this is not normal what's happening here today. This kind of experience where missions is highlighted for the whole church. And there's a, there's a, a group of booths right over here. Listen, I spend seven months a year now uh, going from church to church and campus to campus, setting up booths, inviting people to come by and hang out with us. So when we're done in a moment, I know Mark's going to hit this in a minute, but when we're done in a moment, would you make sure you go hang out with all these missionaries because they're amazing. I want you to know that. Seriously, they've given up a lot of their lives and their livelihood to invest in places that are really, really hard to reach for the gospel, locally uh, and, and you know across the globe. So go hang out with them. And uh, man, I get to do that, like I'm going to Liberty in a couple of weeks, and we're going to be all over the country talking about missions. And this whole idea here is that God's inviting you, God's inviting me uh, to join him in mission. And this invitation is personal. Sometimes when we hear talk, talks about missions or talks about living your life on mission, we go, oh, that's... That's, that's for somebody else. I'm, I'm not going to go to Europe or Colombia or, or Papua New Guinea. I'm, I'm not that person. This, is, this talk's really not for me. And what I, one of the things I would love for you to recognize today is that every step you take out of this building through this week for the rest of your life, you are on mission. We're all on mission. Whether it's across the street, across the cul-de-sac, or across an ocean, you and I are called to live our lives on mission. This invitation is personal. He's inviting you today to join him in his kingdom activity. In order for that to happen, though, you and I have to do this first thing he said. He said, and he said to all, if anyone, that's the invitation Jesus always invites, would come after me, let him deny himself. So the first thing you and I have to do if we're going to be answering this call today is to deny ourselves. So what does that mean, deny yourself? Here's, what I, here's kind of my definition for deny yourself. It's saying no to the things the world says yes to. That's denying yourself. Others may, but I may not. It's it's looking at the landscape of our world around us, our current context, and saying, I'm going to say no to the things that the world says yes to so that I can be a part of God's kingdom activity to take the gospel to my neighbors and the nation. And listen, 
I, I was driving. Listen, this is, a, this is a bougie place, okay? I mean, where y'all live, I was driving, I was driving down the, the bay here, and I'm like, man, this is not my world, okay? I'm like driving down here. I'm like, I'm like driving up here, and I'm like, man, this place, this is crazy. I've been here once before, but I'm like, this is pretty bougie, okay? And so your staff's not bougie, but, um, but your, your, your context is, okay? And so, so here's, here's what I want you to recognize today. You and I, if we're not careful, we can get numb in our comfort to the things around us, the lostness and the desperation and the hurt and the need. And so I want to challenge you to deny yourself, say no to the things the world says yes to. And what does the world say yes to? The world says yes to this relentless and endless pursuit of pleasure and treasure. And God's calling you and me today to see all that and say no to the things the world says yes to. I told you this was going to be hard this morning. Okay, This is a hard teaching because deep down in our hearts, we love comfort. We love our trinkets. We love the treasure and pleasure of this world, but this world is not our home. It's another kingdom, and we're to be building the kingdom. So denying yourself takes this heart to say no to the things the world says yes to. And so denying yourself is declaring then every single day that your yes is on the table no matter what the question is from God. And so the idea is that moment by moment, we walk with Christ as Christ followers, taking up this posture of denying ourselves, and we're saying yes to the Lord every single day. Is your life today, is your life interruptible? I know you have dreams. I know you have plans. I know the pressure of the world to pursue the trinkets and the treasure of the and pleasure of the world, but let me ask you a question today. Are you willing to say to the Lord, my yes is on the table, and I, I am saying today, Lord, I'm declaring today that my life is interruptible. Your yes is on the table. Um, I just did uh, a, a, a little vacation uh, in Destin, okay, on the way down here. We drove from Arkansas. I preached in Texas, and then it's not really like the directest path, right, from Arkansas to Florida. But I preached in Texas, and then we went to Destin, which is our favorite place to hang out. Um, and I binged watched my sons. Uh, again, they're old. They're now like adults. And uh, they said, Dad, you, have you seen uh, Masters of the Air? I'm like, no, I haven't seen it. It must have come out while I was head down in, in England, right? Or I don't know when it came out. But anyway, and, and um, so I binged watched Masters of the Air. It's, it's really gruesome, okay? Um, but it's this picture of guys who every single day got in a plane, a B-17, and flew over uh, Germany, and like 10 fortresses every time they flew would get blown out of the sky. And these guys would get in a plane knowing that... In all likelihood, it could be their last activity on earth. And the commander would say, here we go, this is the assignment. And those guys would just go. Holy cow. That's what I'm talking about. Is your yes on the table? What is God saying to you today? No matter, no matter what it is, is your yes, is your posture under your commanding officer Yes, I was born at MacDill Air Force Base. So I got a little Air Force in me, okay? And just this idea that I'm actually home. This is weird, actually. Um, but this idea that the commander says, yes, this is, what, this is the call. This is what we're doing. And the, and the guys, the troops, the, the, the folks that they're going to go lay their life on the line, their response is, my yes is on the table. And so if that's your posture today, buckle up because your life's about to change, right? Because he's calling us into denying ourselves and taking up his cross daily 
and following him. In 2005, I shared briefly a moment ago, uh, was my first time I went to England on a mission trip. And I'd been all over the world. I'd been from Philippines to, uh, to Guatemala and Cuba, not Cuba, uh, Haiti, uh, just all over the world doing missions as a youth pastor. That's kind of what we do. You know, we're trying to introduce a generation to the lostness of the world and the need in the world. And so I took my first group to England in 2005, and it, it messed me up. Seriously, it, it dramatically changed our, our lives. I actually wrote in my journal on that trip, God, is this a place I'm going to spend significant time, life, and ministry? Here's why. There are churches just like here. From, from the hotel to here, I passed 100 churches. There's churches all over England and Europe. They're empty. They're museums. And I couldn't wrap my head around it. I come home to a youth ministry of 1,000 teenagers and a church of 8,000 people, and everybody seemed to love Jesus. This is the largest crowd I'll ever preach to in England, seriously, right now. This is the biggest audience that we'd ever preach to in England. Massive, this crowd, compared to what's going on in England and Europe. And I couldn't reconcile it in my head, the desperation and the need there. And so we began to process what it would look like to, to move from Texas to Teesside. It took us five years to get over ourselves. And that, you know, I got to raise support to move. I had a paycheck, right? And, and like, who's in charge? God's in charge. And we had to wrestle through so many things as followers of Christ to say, God, can you hold us? Can you take care of us? Will you, is this really the call of God in our life? And so by 2010, um, I was miserable as a minister of the gospel in America. And I was just like, family, we're, we're going to get together at Christmas and pray. And so we did. And as a family, we made the decision, uh, we're, we're going for it. And so on January 2nd, 2011, we resigned uh, our church position and began raising support. And by summer, the Lord had miraculously provided for us to move to England. I had a visa. We were kind of funded. Not really. Those of you that are missionaries understand what that feels like. Um, and, and, and then we launched, right? And, uh, and so, yeah, so we lived on the ground there from 2011 uh, to 2020 when COVID started. And then I, I took on this role with Greater Europe Mission to mobilize the church in America, to, to give their lives away um, for the gospel across the continent of Europe. And so um, our life, I want to challenge you this morning to think, is my life interruptible? Now listen, I don't think everybody's called to Europe. Actually, I don't think everybody's called to hop an ocean. But I know this, you are called to live an interruptible life, whatever that looks like. Between here and work, Work in the grocery store, grocery store and home, wherever your foot falls, the campus at Plant High School, wherever you're going this week, you are called to live an interruptible life. Slow down and invest the gospel in people. That's what we're called to do. So deny yourself. The second thing is take up your cross. Take up your cross. This is personal and it's your cross. Now listen, that audience... When they heard that, they knew the cross was this instrument of unspeakable suffering and death. And so again, this is a hard teaching. Jesus has the crowds gathering around him. There's a little bit of, wow, buzz going on around Jesus. And he drops these words into that audience. Take up your cross and follow me. Jesus' audience that day, when they heard that, they knew because they see it over and over and over again what the Romans would do to their enemies, unspeakable suffering and death. And so the cross was this picture of suffering and pain and death. And when they heard that, their thought was sacrifice. We talked a moment ago, Mark was talking about your giving, your sacrificial giving uh, fuels the missions of this church all over the world. And we're talking about sacrifice. We're talking about laying our life down, taking up our cross. And it could be 
a sacrifice financially to this local congregation to invest the seeds of the gospel, the, the word of God going across the nations. It could be um, your, your uh, own life, though. Maybe God's stirring you to hop into one of these trips that this, this church is going to take in the, years, in the days to come. Or maybe it's, man, I've been praying about something else, and maybe it's me going. Maybe it's our family going. Listen, we were, I was late 40s when we made the decision to move to England. It's not your typical missionary path. You know what I'm saying? Come out of college, you, 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 you know, maybe you, you join a, a ministry and an organization and you kind of ramp up to this, right? But we were like, I had two kids in college, one about to go to college, the caboose who didn't have a choice. And, and you know, we're, we're leaving this nation and going to another nation. So some of you are in your mid 40s or early 50s and you're like, Man, I don't know. Is this, this guy's crazy. He's telling me I need to leave my treasure and my pleasure and go to another part of the world. That's what we're talking about today. It's personal. It's your invitation. Take up your cross and live a life of sacrifice. It's dying to yourself to live for the kingdom. Dying to yourself to live for the gospel. And dying to ourselves can feel like a bad thing. Most people want to exalt, applaud, and promote themselves and climb the corporate ladder and achieve personal greatness. But in God's upside-down economy, in God's kingdom economy, dying to ourselves is essential. It's the essence of following Christ. Galatians 2.20 says, I've been crucified with Christ it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Philippians 2, chapter 5. I mean, uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Man, you should meditate on chapter 2, uh, you know, while you're watching whatever you're going to watch this afternoon. Or why, right before you come pack Food bags, okay? Read uh, uh, Philippians chapter 2. Listen to verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Dying to live. A lump of clay cannot become a work of art unless it's shaped into something else. A container of paint cannot be used for a masterpiece unless it's poured out. A carbon deposit must change in order to become a diamond. And all of us watch the biology, the metamorphosis of a caterpillar to a butterfly. That caterpillar literally processes through and, and dies and becomes this magnific magnificent butterfly. The invitation today is to die. And it's actually an invitation, I believe, to real life. That's what we're asking for you today. Take up is an invitation to willingly lay down your life today and every day. And so watch this. If you and I can process this thought that I am willing to die, my yes is on the table. Like, if we can get to the place where I'm going to process this so much so today that my yes is on the table, God, my life is interrupt interruptible, if you can get to the place where you are ready to die for what you believe in. Listen, in America in 2024, I'm not, I don't feel threatened by what I believe, but there's some scenes going on across Europe right now that they're, they're pretty weird. Like, people are dying for what they believe in. People all across the world, the persecuted church, there are more Christians persecuted now than ever before, dying for what they believe in. So if you can wrap your head around dying for what you believe in, come to grips with that today, you're prepared to say, Lord, no matter what, I'm ready to suffer and die for you. If you can get to that place, watch this. If you can get to that place, doesn't it make sense then that you're ready and willing to live for him? Right? 
I mean, if you and I can get to the place where I'm ready to die for what I believe in, then doesn't it make living for him moment by moment that much more real? It's not easy, but it's real. Like today, God, I'm going to live for you. So what does that look like? It looks like follow me. That's what Jesus said. Take up your cross daily, die to yourself, and follow me. Jesus has a plan for your life. And your number one plan for your life is, Jesus' number one plan for your life is to be a fisher of men. That's the number one calling all of us have been given by God is to go and make disciples. Your investment brokerage or your school teacher role or your coach role, whatever your role is, is a means to an end, but it's not the end. The end is the gospel, the gospel, the gospel, and making disciples. So how do, how do you and I do that? Well, I want to pick up Romans chapter 12 really quick. I'm going to read this verse over us. And I want to, I want to pick up three words because I believe follow me looks like what we're about to unpack. It's wherever and whenever my neighbor and, my, and to the nations. But listen to Romans 12, 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. So the first word is the word surrender. Surrender today to this call of God on your life to be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship or your spiritual act of worship. Do not be conformed to this world Be set apart, be separate, be different. That's what it means. Don't be conformed to this world, but but look different. Live different. Be set apart, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what what is good, acceptable, and perfect. To be spirit-minded. God-sized dreams, kingdom dreams come through the Holy Spirit and people that are spirit-minded. Listen, I, I'm, I am in my 60s, okay? And I, I'm looking at the last part of my life. And I want to go as hard as I can for as long as I can for the gospel of God and the kingdom of God and to multiply disciples. What God-sized dream do you have? for your life and for your family. What's out there for you? He says, come after me. Have you made the decision to come to Jesus today, to surrender in salvation? Surrender is this moment in time. For me, August 1978, 16 years old, I surrendered to Christ in salvation. Surrender is not only a moment in time, it's also moment by moment. Surrender daily. So surrender and salvation, yes, all of us need to come to Christ. But every single day you roll your uh, body out of bed and your feet at the floor, you have an opportunity today to say, God, I surrender. My life is yours. My yes is on the table. My hands are open. My life is interruptible. I surrender. And it's moment by moment. All throughout the day, this constant practicing the presence of God, I surrender to you today. And then surrender to a global calling. And this is a season of moments, right? Surrender is a moment. It's moment by moment. But if you're going to go global or you're going to wrap your heart around um, a ministry here today to invest your life in, It's a season of moments. It's you saying to the Lord, God, I'm going to step all in with these people, and I'm going to give financially. I'm going to give sacrificially. I'm going to give with my hands. I'm going to give with my energy. I'm going to pour out in a season of moments and live my life on mission. God can and will, and, and he actually wants to today. Listen to this. God can and will, and I believe he actually wants to today, 
Realign your plans. Reshape your desires. And repurpose your gifts for his glory. I'll say that again. I believe God can and will, and he actually wants to, realign your plans, reshape your desires, and repurpose your gifts for his glory. The last point I want to spend some time on is this whole idea of worth the risk. Jesus is worth it. Everything we spend our time on related to this kingdom, talking about this present kingdom, is going to pale and fade and get rusty. And it's, honestly, it's pointless. We get so stressed out about all the trinkets and treasure and keeping up with all the stuff. And the reality is, it's all fading. The things of this world, I love the worship we had this morning. The things of this world grow strangely dim in light of his glory and grace. The things of this world grow strangely dim in light of his glory and grace. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. He's worth it. Whatever the cost, whatever the cost today for you, he's worth it. Whatever the sacrifice today, he's worth it. Whatever the risk today, he's worth it. Listen to these verses. Whatever the cost, he's worth it. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits his soul? Whatever the sacrifice, he's worth it. Romans 8, 18. For I consider that the suffering, sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Romans 8, 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Whatever the risk, he's worth it. What's the risk? This light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Whatever the cost, he's worth it. Whatever the sacrifice, he is worth it. Whatever the risk, he is worth it. Um, I'm pretty convinced that most of us still live in relative comfort, including myself. I don't wonder if the light's going to come on when I walk in my kitchen or if my toilet's going to flush when it's time to flush it. Or when I go into the refrigerator and open the door and I still don't understand how the light comes on at that perfect time. But, but the idea that there's food in my refrigerator. We live in relative comfort. But I'm inviting you today into a life of risk. What is risk? It's a life of faith. Risk, when we live a life of risk, what are we saying? We're stepping out of our comfort zone. Our yes is on the table and I'm way out here. And I'm saying, God, you have me. Get out of your comfort zone, whatever that is, and get into a life of faith and a life of risk. Because here's what happens when we do that. We move ourselves from an understanding of I've got this to a life of there's no way I can do this way out here without him. So what does that do? Risk leads to dependency on God, right? And most of us, we live a relative rhythm of life where we don't feel this sense of urgency. Like, God, I can't make it today without you. When was, when was the last time you felt that deep in your heart as you were pushing into the kingdom of God that you were out there so far that you're saying as you wake up, God, I can't do this day with all that you're calling me to that's of faith without you. So faith or risk leads to this spirit of dependency that you can't get without risking. And y'all, that's where we're meant to live. A life of faith. The Bible says whatever is not of faith is 
Sin. Hello, wrap your minds around that. If I'm stuck in comfort and a lack of faith, then I'm, I'm not really walking in the power of the Holy Spirit in this yielded life to the Lord. And that's where we're meant to live every single day. That's why Christianity uh, can sometimes be perceived as boring to the world around us because we just live this mundane, rote, comfortable life. And the world is looking for a people who would say, I'm interruptible. My life is his. I'm willing to risk for the glory of God. It's a life of faith. And so risk leads to dependency, and dependency then leads to this intimacy with God that I don't think you can get without risking. And so that's where he wants us to be. So I want us to pray. I want you to bow your heads, and I'm not sure. I know Mark's going to come up in a moment, but I want to invite you to just hold your hands out before you and just say, Lord, just quietly before the Lord, here I am. And just like Isaiah, here I am, send me. God, what a, send me to my neighbors. Send me to my coworkers. Send me to my high school. Send me across an ocean. Just lay your hands before the Lord. My life is interruptible, God. Whatever you want, this season of my life. Lord, we love you today. We're grateful for this church. Just this idea about Missions Sunday, just this focus on mission connections all across the world is a gift, and we're grateful. But Lord, this is personal today. This is about me. This is about people in this room and what you're inviting them into. And so I pray you do business in our hearts today. Even throughout this week, remind us of your calling on our life for this season. And we're grateful in Jesus' name. Amen.